shocking and disturbing new developments into how convicted sex offender John Gardner III was able to stay out of prison and allegedly hunt for more victims. This man violated his parole for molesting a 13-year-old girl in 2000. He violated it time and time and time again. But they never took him off the streets. Plus, did you know that he is the father of twin boys? Gardner is charged with rape and murder in the death of 17-year-old Chelsea King. She was attacked and killed last month while jogging in a San Diego park. And now cops are looking at him for the murder of 14-year-old Amber Dubois. Her remains were found last week, not too far from where Chelsea was discovered. Listen to John Gardner in court this week. Has Mr. Gardner been advised of those rights? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Gardner, do you understand those rights? Do you agree to waive time for your preliminary examination? Yes. Parole records show Gardner was caught living too close to a school in 2007. Plus, he had at least six other violations. Six! Let's not forget that he was living just a couple of miles from Escondido High School when Amber Dubois disappeared in February of 2009. If authorities had done their job properly, this poor family might still have their daughter. How many times do our daughters need to be raped before we put these monsters behind bars forever? We really have to fix this junk justice system. It is broken. Straight out to my fantastic panel, criminal defense attorney Mark Iglarsh. Former criminal investigator Steve Cardian, psychotherapist Jen Berman, and we're honored to have with us again tonight, Aaron Runyon. Thank you so much for joining us, Aaron. Uh, Aaron's five-year-old daughter, Samantha, precious child, was kidnapped and murdered in 2002. Aaron, what is your reaction to Gardner's ability to violate his parole so many times and still live on the outside? It is infuriating. You know, we keep passing laws to give law enforcement more and more tools to get these guys when they violate their parole, and yet we're not using those tools. I, it's, it's just, it's very disheartening, and I think that it's time that we, in California at least, take a stand and make sure that we are funding our parole officers to be able to have safe teams who are looking after these guys in a real fashion. Steve Cardian. Uh, the spokesperson for the corrections department responded to this news that, oh, there were all these parole violations by saying, quote, there was nothing to indicate that he would do this or allegedly do this. I guess one can always look back, but we don't have the luxury. Bunk! In 2000, well, there was a psychiatrist who testified he was predatory and a danger to society, begged them not to release him and said that he would attack girls again. Yes, Jay, we've talked about broken justice before, and we see here where the district attorney's office and the court system failed. Uh, the, the psychiatrist had indicated that he, he was likely to, 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 to commit again, uh, and he did, and he was only given a short sentence of prison. All the red flags that occurred post him being released uh, were, were, were red flags, but the probation department may not have been able to act upon those red flags uh, because of the, the minor degree in nature, although they are red flags oh, that should have been looked at closely. you know what? It, it, okay, four of the infractions to his parole involve letting the battery on his ankle bracelet run low. One, Mark Iglarsh, for missing a meeting with his parole officer, and one for alleged marijuana possession that apparently couldn't be substantiated. Why not? Why not? And this is what they go on to say, Mark. Oh, well, these are considered minor. Quite frankly, if we were to blanket the system of parolees with minor offenses, we would overwhelm the system. We'd close Jay. the system down. Jane, is that, is that your man? Is, it, is that your man voice? I don't That's know what that was. That's my bureaucrat yeah. voice. Bureaucratic voice. Okay, let me respond. Yeah, in hindsight, I, I do agree with them in some respects. In hindsight, it's easier to go back and say, my God, we should have nailed them on one of these what we call technicals. But these technical violations are difficult to prove, and you can't launch someone for 10, 20 years, typically on these types of offenses. It's easy to do that looking back, but at the time, they were minor technicalities that were probably dealt with to the best of their level of ability at the time. Yeah, you know what? The corrections department fought like heck to keep us from learning this. 
okay? There was an effort to stop these documents from being released. Why? Maybe they feel a little guilty. I dispute the notion that it's impossible to verify that you've let your monitoring battery die or get low, Aaron Runyon. I think it's easy to verify it would be low. It, it's very easy to verify, and he would have been, he should have been eligible for lifetime GPS. He should not have been off of his GPS. That was yeah. what, he was taken off of that after just, I think, two and a half years. Yeah, after he commits these infractions, yes, Jen Berman, after he commits all these infractions and they fail to lock him up, they then take off his ankle bracelet and chuck it and say, run free. Yeah, these child predators just don't get better. Our children are never safe as long as these kinds of people are out there, and the law needs to take it a whole lot more seriously and protect our kids. It would appear there's a lot of drinking going on in the Gardner family, and we would love to hear from them or their attorneys to get their side of the story. In his probation report, Gardner says his uncle, stepfather, and biological father are all alcoholics. His mother and stepfather reportedly belong to some sort of drinking and running club. And how's this for chilling irony? The club held a run on the very same day and in the location where Gardner was accused of attacking Chelsea King. Okay, oh, actually that was before, that was in December. That woman, uh, her name was Candace, was a jogger who elbowed this guy in the face and ran away. Listen to this. You know, I have a real problem with the fact that he was allowed to be there, first of all, and that when news broke of this, and you, you have a son who has a past like this, as a mother, how can you not at least think about it and think about the possibility of what may have happened and how you may know something? Jen Berman, here's a shocker. Court documents show Gardner was taking at least eight different psychiatric medications while living with his mother, including Ritalin, Zoloft, and Paxil. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, someone is prescribing, someone thinks that this guy is, is depressed. Clearly he had a bad childhood, but there's no bad childhood that can justify the kind of heinous acts that this man has committed. And I agree, I do think that if this is true, if he was living in his mother's home without being registered as a sex offender and she knew about this, then her, this, her, this child's blood is on her hands. Let me get to this. Uh, this man who molested a 13-year-old girl, it turns out, is the father of twin boys. John Gardner never married the mother. We believe she is Jariah Baker. Here she is from her Facebook page. Baker and Gardner lived together in 2009, not far from Escondido High School, Steve Cardian. That's where 14-year-old Amber Dubois disappeared. To her credit, Baker is now working with authorities on this case. And Jane, hopefully she can provide them with some insight and information into the case. The, the timing, the location of where she went missing and where he was at the time that she went missing is just too coincidental. It's so disturbing. And we're going to stay on top of this one coming up right after the break. <sighs> A disturbing update. Ralph and Shell are teaming up to fill your tank for less.